Hello, everyone, and welcome. We are Irenacast. I'm Jeff. It's your boy, Alan. And this is Rajiv. Thanks for joining us for our continuing conversation to provoke your progressive Christian imagination. This week, we're going to be talking about our most recent episode, which is episode 170 uh, in evangelicalism. Uh, so we're excited about that as we're kind of waiting for everyone to come on. Don't forget to say hi in the comments so that we know that you're here. Uh, we won't call you out unless you say hi, so we won't we won't embarrass anyone. Uh, but we do want to hear from you because that's the point of this particular uh, place is to hear from you specifically about the episode that we just did. Again, um, that. But as we're getting ready to go for to this on the podcast feed, you can check the show notes for this uh, episode at irenicast.com slash 170 live. That's irenicast.com slash 170 live. Live 170? Yes. <laughs> Live 170. Uh, and uh, before we get started, we got some important announcement right at the beginning. Uh, Rajiv and Bonnie are going, not solo, but they're starting a brand new podcast that's going to yeah. come to you on the second, third of every month. Yep. Yep. And it's called Haystack. <laughs> So if you yeah. have a friend, or, well, I'm not going to say anything, Rajiv. Yeah, it's about Haystacks. <laughs> so Haystacks is a podcast designed specifically for fringe, or former, or ex Seventh Day Adventists. And um, yeah, we're going to do it once a month to start off, second Tuesday of the month. So that's tomorrow. But those of you that are tuned in, it's already up. We're not going to be pushing it out till the morning, but uh, we're on. Apple and Stitcher, and you can always go to the website, haystackspodcast.com, and listen from there, download, share it with people. Um, but yeah, and and the, the term haystacks is very much an insider Seventh-day Adventist term. It's a way of building a taco salad that even those of us that have left forever ago, it's still one of the favorite meals. It's They're, they're the best. <clears throat> All right, so make sure everyone checks that out. We'll put that in the show notes for this episode. It'll be on our website. It'll be all over the place. You'll be hearing about it over the next kickstart that. So if you are a former Seventh Day Adventist or you know someone who is, recommend yeah. that go to them. Sure, I'm, please. <clears throat> I'm not a Seventh Day Adventist, but I was brought in on the world of haystacks, the that salad that you guys like, and oh, then yeah. I have friends across the country who are seventh, who are former Seventh Day Adventists and current ones. And apparently uh -huh. everybody does it everywhere. It's everywhere. It's like a, a thing. It so I feel, I feel honored to have experienced it. It's, it's a for <laughs> real thing. So <laughs> definitely make sure. And I forgot to mention at the top of the show, Bonnie and Casey are on assignment this week. So they will be joining us on the, the next the next episode, which we'll talk about at the end of this conversation. So if you're joining us, please feel free to stay, say hello. Um, and as we're waiting for people to kind of come in and comment, do you, either of you two, have any anything you want to discuss or readdress from our episode on uh, white supremacy last week? Man, it was it was quite an episode. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot, and I think uh, I'm I'm dealing with like I'm still coming to grips with seeing whiteness for what it is. I think it's going to be a long yeah. journey for me. <laughs> but that feels like the really first important step is like recognizing what it is, how it functions, what its history is, and mm -hmm. how it's like thing and not a real thing at the same time, something you have to address um, <clears throat> and think through. And uh, for, all, for anyone listening, uh, we're, we're talking about white supremacy and more fundamentalistic or evangelical circles. And um, at least in my experience, and what I heard people say in the episode, I, th I, I can't remember if it was Casey or Bonnie, but they said that uh, whiteness seeks to not be named. And that was full. My experience growing up in church is that, you know, we didn't think of ourselves as a white church, even though we very, very much were uh, because whiteness was just normative or thought of as normative. So my sacred work right now is discovering like, what that even meant and what that means for me to be in white spaces, how it functions. And uh, 
I've, I've had experiences re- recently where I've gotten to kind of shift out of that to just some degree and see it from different perspectives. Um, you know, went to a rally where there was a lot of white people who were there uh, in kind of a power dynamic that was not super safe that taught me a lot. And then I went through a, a course recently in my doctoral work with people who are studying oppression. And so we were studying that together and to be able to kind of evaluate my own experience, just realizing how much I, I have to learn in just understanding how it operates. And that alone is um, a product of the in, like invisibility of white supremacy. So that's where I'm at. So it's like thinking through right now. I also brought my Awana books. If anybody wanted to see them. <laughs> uh, I mentioned this in the episode, but uh, you know, we were taught when we were children Oh, sorry, sorry, mom and dad, if you're watching this, uh, I really appreciate all that you've done for me and everything. I'll cover their names. Should I do that? Should I cover the names of the, the adults who taught me this stuff? So we were taught, right, sin, it, it looks like poop and you're supposed to say no to it. Like it's a big part of it. There's like, we were taught things like, you know, you're falling off a cliff and uh, everybody is sinful and everybody like sins in so many different ways. It's not something I would necessarily teach children uh, in the same way these days, but nowhere did we ever talk about racism, like my upbringing. And so in fact, the, the way that these like memorization books were set up, like, you know, indigenous cultures and folks were used as like a, a, I don't know if I, I don't know why I'm doing this right now, but, I am. Um, it was used as like kind of window dressing or something. And then, you know, we were were taught patriotism in the church and like a bunch of white kids standing in front of a bunch of white founding fathers, you know? And, uh, so the, the looking at it from the eyes I have now, a lot of people say, you know, my church didn't have any white supremacy. And I think the most important question for folks who are experiencing that is, did they have anything that taught against it? You know, did you ever hear any messages against that or that even questioned um, how that operates? And I and for a lot of us, the answer is no. We were never taught about racism, never taught about oppression historically or, or how it functioned now. So that's something I'm, I'm wrestling through. Wana was appropriating Native Absolutely. In so yeah. many ways. Even like, I know that Wana is like an acronym. But it's an acronym that sounds a little bit like they wanted it to sound like it was some sort of Native American term. Maybe that's speculation, but it that's how I, I was in Awana briefly before I went to a different denomination. And I remember uh, one of the leaders using the word Awana in, uh, you know, like he was going to a Redskins game or something. You know what I mean? Like really... Mm-hmm chanting that and all that kind of stuff so i think it's at the very least it's a little misogynistic right approved well, work workmen are not ashamed right, mm-hmm. right. so I, I guess what i'm trying to say is i'm still i'm still in the phase of like identifying how white supremacy was operative for me and um i heard myself talking on that episode and it's like i think there there's some folks who are just looking for they're looking for evidence so much that to even perceive it as like you know a fish in water or something like that Rajiv how about you any musings about our recent episode (laughs) I mean it's a it's a good conversation it's it's a tough one to have um you know like you pointed out Alan it is you know, it's it's one of those things that, you know, the closest peril that I have is maleness and heteronormativity. Is, you know, you just walk around thinking that's the way it's supposed to be. And until you take the time to notice it and examine it, um, it's just in your mind is the way it's supposed to be. Uh, but the fact, the fact that people walk around and are just willing to continue walking around that way is really frustrating uh, and, and downright, you know, angering. 
in a lot of ways. And I, and I say that, you know, in a multiple formats. So there's, there's the race thing, there's gender thing, you know, maleness, um, privilege in, in various ways. It's a, uh, it's a real problem. You know, life is good if it's good for you. Yeah, <laughs> that's, a, that's a, that's a good way to put it. Um, for those of you that are that are coming in, don't forget to, to say hi in the comments or give your thoughts on this particular episode or anything that we're saying right now. Uh, I do want to draw attention to uh, when we posted this episode, this episode on Facebook, we of our listeners, uh, Nancy White, and uh, she said, and I thought there's some interesting stuff here that might be something we can discuss as well. But she said, while listening, it struck me that lately the evangelical church has spent so much time preaching against other, quote, sins homosexuality, abortion, uh, and then she put in, uh, you know, parentheses, I can't, I actually can't think of another overarching one at the moment, uh, that they've glossed over the sin of partiality from James 2, specifically. Maybe that's the result of wanting to conserve whiteness, or maybe it's following the narrative handed down for generations without thinking through it. I think that's a really interesting point bringing up. Um, Richard, thank you for uh rajiv thanks thanks richard you're my favorite lisa welcome <laughs> welcome to the conversation hey lisa, lisa. my favorite let's not let's not fight over richard he's the best <laughs> richard um, loves me the most. <laughs> <laughs> but uh i think that's an interesting correlation between james 2 for so if, if you're listening and you're not familiar james 2 you know they're talking about how if there's someone you know in evangelicalism i remember this used a lot but if someone comes into the church and they're uh, you know, destitute or whatever, are you going to treat them the same? Are you going to, you know, reserve the spot for the people that are, you know, wealthier in the church and that, that idea of partiality specifically in that verse or in that section of scripture, you know, talking specifically about wealth. But, um, I think that that's a thing that the idea of partiality that, that a lot of white evangelicals don't see, um, Anyway, I'm. I'm. What do you guys think? I'm. I'm gonna stop rambling. Yeah, I. I don't. I don't think it's. It's as unknowing as we like to make it. Um, come across, you know, it's. It's pretty deliberate and it's pretty sinister. It's just if you're part of it, some degree of you, and again, I. I. I can correlate this to maleness. Is part of you is kind of glad you're there. Because it's easier for you than it is for other people, um, and and you're not sure you entirely want to lose all that. You just want it to be better for other people too. Um, and whether that can happen or not is is certainly a question lots of people wrestle with. But um, I mean to to push a show here, but it's on. Uh, I think it's on Hulu. Mrs. America. It chronicles. It's pretty good historical docudrama. It, it chronicles the the ERA amendment, um, and the the calculation of the right wing, the moral majority. You know, like in this, they talk about Jerry Falwell a little bit. He's kind of like a nobody. You know, he like needs Phyllis Schlafly and others to become somebody. So th this was all pretty calculated. And, and done by design to focus on those kinds of hot button issues that would then push aside everything else uh, that was justice focused or decency minded. And, you know, just because you're not aware that people are behind the scenes pulling the strings, you know, if you're an adult, there comes an age of accountability where you got to know some shit before you start mouthing off. <laughs> I my I understand what you're saying. I think there is there is a part of evangelicals and a part of, of a lot of white people who are in privilege and they know they are. You know, there is that like really deep part of them that knows this. But I still think that like the illusions are really powerful that things are just fair. Like if the system and the structure itself is already oppressive, um, when I hear things like, you know, don't show partiality. I hear that like weaponized in the evangelical church, you know, like the whole like refusal to admit that the structure itself is racist, that our country was founded on racism and that a lot of our 
religions operated on that. So I know a lot of people who feel they're just fair and, and there's a denial that uh, systemic racism is real, at least in, you know, the evangelical world. I think that's that was a large to a large degree, at least in white churches, the case. So um, I don't know how much of people, you know, our own selves really recognize that or. I know what you're saying, Rajiv, but like it still is insidious for a lot of folks and probably not so much now. Right. Because of the conversations that are happening around around the country inside of evangelical churches. I don't know if you've seen some of those lately, but they're happening. They're happening at big denominational events. And I guess they've always sort of happened. But yeah, but what at what point do you you think to yourself or should one think to themselves? Why? Why are things the way they are? Why does that group of people across town, you know, not have running water or clean drinking water? I mean, you know, that, that that's it takes work. It's like I, I remember as a classroom teacher, I was to get an F. Mm. You know, you've got to really try hard to do nothing. <laughs> you know, even if you turn in the basic <laughs> stuff, you you don't even have to try very much. You can get a D. You can, you know, pass minimally. So I, I don't know. There, there, there comes an age where you, you've got to look up. And, and I think a lot of people do. But. The temptation is, you know, I've got it easier than X, Y, Z, and I kind of want to keep it that way. I, I, I th honestly think that's where most people are when it comes to, you know, various levels of privilege. The other part of that comment that I find really helpful is like, yeah, we, we didn't, this wasn't a discussion that evangelical churches were having ever. That, that we've we talked about other issues as if they were the defining moment of the day, whereas mm -hmm. this was yeah, something that was completely silent. But why is that? That's the thing. It's like right. why why not this particular thing? Because if you asked any racism is a big deal, they may think that it was solved with Martin Luther King Jr. or whatever. But why wasn't it included in that? And part of that is because it wasn't there. Uh, there's like you were saying. There's that idea of fairness. But what is what does that even mean? Like they think the the world is fair, but what what does that mean? Because then these are the same people that are saying it's not fair, not all, of them, but within within the realm of the ideology of evangelicalism, that their rights are being taken away because they can't sing at church. Things aren't fair, right? Um, due to the current pandemic, so I think it's I think it's more of an indictment of the culture of evangelicalism that it's not even something that's considered that big of a deal mm -hmm. because it it can't. And the, and the reason that it's not called out or looked at a little bit more, I think, is because it's associated with a political ideology mm -hmm. that is not their own, that they've already demonized in all other areas. So if you, you know, if you give hold, then you're going to allow all that left ideology to come into evangelicalism. So I think it's, it's I think it's a willful ignorance um, mm -hmm. from from leadership within evangelicalism that has allowed it to stick around. Mm -hmm. so I've heard an interesting hypothesis it's saying exactly what you're saying. Before I say it, I just wanted to invite folks who are who are listening and our listeners to share their experiences of uh, white supremacy in their backgrounds. And in, like, did you hear about it? How you know? How did you experience it? Um, so feel free to leave a comment. But uh, I've heard the the theory that evangelicals lost the cultural war against instituting racism in law and enshrining it in law because you think about the fights against civil rights that were that were headed by huge evangelical leaders in churches who fought you know integration who fought who were pro segregation and they did it publicly and they used theology to back it up and then once they lost that battle in the public square they just shifted they shifted to other other issues they shifted to family or they shifted to uh i don't know a uh, of, you know, reproductive rights or something. And then that became culturally palatable for them to have that be their central focus. Whereas they didn't really have a change of heart or a change of way of doing things. They just had a different section of society that, that was like politically appropriate to have these huge battles for. And ultimately what it is, is, and in my experience, needs an us and them. 
It needs an enemy to be able to survive because it has to be your group of people versus the world. It has to be those on the inside against those on the outside. And so the reason racism wasn't talked about or like white supremacy wasn't talked about is because a lot of us were the we're we're the ones pushing for enshrining racism in law. And then we just shifted to other so when I hear that comment saying, you know, we, we heard messages about family things or about female you know, productive, you know, uh, productive rights. Uh, that happened was just a, a historical shift, an opportunistic shift. Yeah, and but those each of those issues are connected to issues of race. So when they're talking about the family, what's the number one criticism that people have against the Black Lives Movement matter is that, oh, well, their fathers aren't there. They're in jail. Maybe if they worked on their family, like those criticisms that are connected right. to those issues that they adopted are very much real and rooted in the, that those racist ideologies that, that were there from the beginning. So I think it's I think it's just been masked. Like even if you look at um, uh, whoever it was that was helping Nixon with that, you have that quote from him. I can't remember him, the, the guy right now, but he talked about how they purposely targeted him. The black yeah. community and the, the war on drugs for the hippies and the blacks so that they could discredit them. And then that was the, the, the real meshing of right evangelicalism happening in the 80s with uh, Reagan. And that culminated even by the, the war on drugs and a lot of that kind of stuff. And those are directly tied to issues of race. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, you, you really have to work pretty hard as a white evangelical <laughs> to not be aware. I mean, you know, mega churches are really offshoots of the Southern Baptist convention. You know, they say they're independent, non-denominational, but you look <laughs> at their stuff. It's, it's Southern Baptist. That's exactly and, how I grew up, Rajiv. <laughs> and, yeah, and the Southern Baptist convention, why did they? Right. You know, it was over the issue of slavery. So, I mean, it's, it's like, yeah, I, you know, it's it's fine to to recognize you were wrong and you were you were part of a, a community that's been wrong for decades or centuries um you know but to to try to continue to to play dumb that doesn't serve you well it doesn't serve anybody well I, I wonder how the like dominionist theology you know that we're supposed to dominate the earth or convert everybody to how we are and how we are mm-hmm. happens to be white or happens to be, you know, slaveholder. Absolutely. Culture. Yep. And I wonder, yeah, I wonder if that, if that's why it's connected. Shannon uh, comes in and says it can be so overwhelming when we start to learn about the history of our organizations. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. if, if our organizations and the places that we are a part of can't own it, then they're gonna, they're gonna in some way, shape or form. I mean, in a way, there, there's I, I, <laughs> this this kind of learning that happens to us sometimes. I, I I almost equate this to sort of prophetic level experience. You think about the uh, the biblical characters. You know, who was it? Ezekiel. He laid down on his left side for day after day after day or something because he was just overwhelmed with stuff. Yeah, that that happens. I mean, it it for real happens. Right, and um. And just it's, to to what Alan was saying earlier, it seems embedded in in some of the rhetoric. This is from Lisa. Thank you for commenting. Mm-hmm. Uh, if it's God's will, then He will dot dot dot. God has yep. blessed us. Yep. We will go and save the loss. It is very us versus them. Yep. And how can that not become a cultural thing? A culture. You know sure. I mean? Like that's you're not learning from other people. You're not be. You know, Rajiv talked really early on. Um, like he in some of our conversations about pluralism, like ethic, at least for our theology and religion. And if that's not something you care about, it becomes a cultural battle or a cultural war. Right. Uh, we have someone who commented on um, another point that's not visible here. They commented on the, the video I shared of us live streaming. And they talked about growing up in Calvinism. This is Michelle. Mm-hmm. They set the stage for this, the elect and beloved of God and the other non-elect. So yes, agree with your statement. Plus the Christian right was set up in the sixties to go against integration. The large Christian universities didn't want to integrate. They learned about, yeah, we talked a bit about that in the episode, Mm -hmm. private schools, private elementary schools, private high schools, and then private universities. And I think you're right, Rajiv. It's takes a lot of 
money and effort and energy to not be informed and to be on the wrong side of that. For sure. And and when we're talking about us versus them, the them are always unseen. They're them because they're not amongst you. Like we've we talked about this a little bit in the past. I, I believe Alan, it was when we talked about the um, we talked about the whiteness and evangelicalism with with Joey, right? Where he mentioned how well, why was evangelicalism starting to move quicker in terms of its acceptance of LGBTQ community as opposed to community of race? Well, because they were among them, like they had more experience interacting with people from community than they did people of other races and far as the integration and all that kind of stuff. And I think when, when a them is distanced so much that you've not left space for them among you, then you're, you're going to have a harder time. Uh, I still find it like really tough. I'm dividing it. Yeah. But like, so part of me wants to like, not, you know, like creating space for them within you or something like that. I feel like there's, I feel like because our institution has been so built on, on within this that like, I even feel like seeking places where it's um, more dismantled than that. You know, like right. there are churches working for inclusion that are still very white. That's just the way it is. No, I, I agree with that. I really desire spaces that are like way beyond that, that are beyond just seeking inclusion. But but within within certain and this has just been my experience is that there's always like the them is always marginalized with rhetoric and language. So they're talking about like in my circles, there's always like the left or like there's this monolith of everyone who's on the other side. And if you have even an inkling of that, there's not even room for discussion, even amongst same people. Right. The ideology is, is also us versus them. There's no even there's not even a place welcome because it becomes an issue of, you know slippery slope or you know be careful what you talk about you don't want to end up there all that kind of stuff so conforming and conformity is like a huge a huge and, marker of faithfulness for, and, for more evangelically minded churches and a lot of that conformity is us versus them language yeah well i conform really well <laughs> <laughs> thank I, thanks I, for that I, proclamation i obey rules really well like i care you know i'm good at that but for those of us who weren't and the listeners who weren't good at that, that's, that became painful a lot quicker. Um, and also, you know, anyway, really interesting. Some good thoughts. Feel free. Yeah. You're, you're listening to, to add more. Um, I think just going back a little bit to what we were talking about earlier, but Richard, thanks for chiming in. Lots of queer Pentecostal preachers. That's for sure. Um, I'm I'm also really uncomfortable right now with uh how even so now now that our whole like much more focused than it's been at any other point in my lifetime um at least to my knowledge all these evangelical like inklings are coming out of oh we're going to solve racism the evangelical way you know like Jesus is the answer right. to racism and it's like right. well <laughs> There, there was someone I forgot who he was. When he was like, yeah. "Look, some of y'all have Jesus, and you're still racist. So, <laughs> tell me how G- your Jesus is the answer to racism." You know, right? Uh, well, yeah, that, you know, that's part of the problem, right? Like, okay, once a, a certain portion of evangelical gets it, then they're going to want to be the main person to solve it, and they're going to push out yeah, the people right. who've been doing the work the whole time. And there's that whole yeah. part of the pendulum swing that that we're, we're seeing in bits and pieces. I think I saw something today about uh, Bethel doing some sort of like, I can't speak to that because I live in the town now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't know the specifics, but I'll, uh, I'll, I'll put a story in the show notes for this. Uh, if I can find it. To our uh, podcast. Feed, yes. So. so from what I can tell, man, I, I want to be careful the way I speak about other people. Um, it's one thing to talk about my past. It's another to talk to, other people in town, but basically from what I understand, there have been some black lives matter protests and rallies or efforts that have been turned into more worship, worship events, you know, yeah. by Christians who come in and they take over the whole thing and they're going to solve it. And what that is, is a, like a profound lack of, in my mind, understanding that like, it's bigger than just about you. You know, it's still making it about your institution and culture when you do that. 
and, you know, mission, missionary work itself like has been very racist and still is racist to a huge degree even for more progressively minded people but um oh the church can't properly handle either one that's very true richard that's very true yeah i mean i i didn't mention this in the episode but i thought about it later we were asked when when did we like realize you know and it it took me a long time just because i can't remember when the first time i i realized um cuz i grew up with it but do you remember that that uh there was some documentary about people contacting uncontacted tribes and like well, the term uncontacted tribe is like contacted by who, <laughs> you know, like that's racist in and of itself. But we used to put up like movies in the middle of church and then talk about, oh, look at these missionaries who are going there. And then you knew they were Christian when they started wearing jeans. Like, at least in my mind, as as a person watching it as a kid, it was like it was an exportation of culture as much as anything else. Mm-hmm. There was that movie. What was it called? Um, the tip of the spear, I think. Yeah, the end of the spear, or something like that. One, yeah, you know, where someone. Yeah, there was people who got you know killed and. Yeah, man. Uh, and then also, I, I really loved the Poisonwood Bible. It wasn't written by a Christian, um, Barbara King Solver, but it talked about a missionary family that went into Africa, and it's this novel and trying to convert people away from like. Um, their system of marriage to make it more look more like the one that they're trying to import, and that to me was a a beginning point of starting to think through a little bit. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, Richard says, "Alan, because God lives, I'm assuming you meant because God loves white people. So if we pray for you, it will get better." <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, and then Sarah says, uh, "We are the hands of God, the only ones." Mm-hmm. Uh, he slash he has. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the who is it? Uh, Teresa, I think it's Teresa of Avila. God has no hands but your hands, no face right. but your face, no feet but your feet. Channeling Casey yeah. here, I think that's what he says at his. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's actually a, a a very popular UCC. Sorry, I'm not in the know. I've only been no. one or two. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's a good one. It's a good one for sure. It uh, gives people that charge. Um, yeah, there's, you know, that missionary thing. There's it, India is such an interesting nation. I mean, there's the religious stuff, but just even politically, there's an island off of the eastern coast of India. It's thought to be inhabited by the indigenous people that have been there since humans have been around. You know, they they got to that island and and no one goes. Um, The Indian government was like, well, you know, this is ours, so we should go check it out. This was some time ago. And they got there and, and, you know, they were out there with spears and rocks and stuff and trying to bring down the helicopters. And so they were, you know, right away, one of the things that, you know, Indian politics uh, has embedded in it is sort of respect for life as a Hindu principle in, in a way it's far from perfect but um that's why cows just walk around <laughs> everywhere um but they were like well we're going to leave these people alone they want to be left alone it's their right and they have this um thing from their uh the equivalent of their state department they're like if any foreigner goes over there we'll arrest you before you get to that land cuz you're not you're not supposed to go there it's it's and if you do go there and you get in some kind of trouble you're on your own they're probably going to kill you. And it's like missionary after missionary. There was this guy from some mega church in the United States. Yeah, whatever. Are, you talking about, are you talking about Senegal? No, it's not. It's that's a different country. Okay. Um, that's what I thought. But, but they, uh, you know, and he, he ends up dead is for all they know. Yeah. Um, or he gave up his life and, you know, they adopted him in. We, <laughs> which is a scenario. But it, it's it's like, the, you know, the, the arrogance to think that you could go into a place and you have answers for people who have been in that place for hundreds, hundreds of years is is the most bizarre thing. I mean, what, what sort of um, psychological makeup 
or mental illness does it require for you to, to have that perspective? Oh my gosh, Regine. Uh, Lisa says, uh, growing up in the evangelical church, the answer to anything was Jesus. But yeah, in a wider world, it's not always loving to bring our solutions. Uh, it's loving to come alongside or just listen or be supportive. I think though that I can say with clarity that evangelical Saving people, mm. not loving them. And the two have been conflated uh, for sure. Right. That, that's really well said, Lisa. And there is a difference. Right. There's a difference between loving on people and loving people. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the worst phrase. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so gross. That's so gross. Uh, I got another comment over here. Uh, it's a little bit long. So Ken, um, he said, uh, when the LCA became the ELCA, racial equality wasn't a plank in their platform. Um, and then down here, by the way, the Assemblies of God was actually started by a Southern racist named Charles Fox Parham. And when people started gathering, gravitating toward the Pentecostal movement, coupled with William Seymour's, a black man's preaching and oratory and being locked out of churches when it was discovered he was black, something had to be done. Mm-hmm. And so um, you talked a we mentioned it in the episode. We mentioned that, Jeff. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's, that, that has that background. It is a little overwhelming, isn't it, to, to mm-hmm. hear the histories of our institutions um, and some of the ways that you know, learning about how things came to be can be overwhelming. And, and the thing is, this isn't like a, you're, you're not trying to untangle a spy network. This shit's like there. <laughs> you know? All you got to do is peel back one layer of the onion, and this is all there. You know, there's there's really no cover up here, and and that's it. It's just phenomenal that that we haven't somehow just stepped away and started over. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's got the subtlety of a reality TV show star. Like it's just it's just there. <laughs> Thank God, progressives have fixed all of that for our next episode. <laughs> Talking about how progressives <laughs> have solved their white suprem- their white supremacy addiction and racism. I, I don't think that's the topic of the show, Alan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So next- we, we talked about that. Our next episode will be uh racism in or white supremacy in progressive Christianity. So we're not we're not just we're not just grabbing the low hanging fruit here. We're gonna we're gonna go after our own as well. So <laughs> that's pretty low hanging fruit too. Well, yeah, that's true. <laughs> there either certainly not historically but even even presently sometimes even more more sinister maybe but you know there's that one of the buzzwords in in liberal circles is multiculturalism i think it's starting to fade a little bit but it's still still a thing and in seminary um there was this assignment given like how would you work to become a multicultural church like you're a pastor at, at, at xyz church and then what do you do? I was like, I don't know. I, I do this to myself a lot when it comes to grades. It's like, well, I'm just going to make my point, And then the grade's going to be whatever the grade is. And my answer was like, on this paper was like a, a, a paragraph, maybe two paragraphs long. It's just like, if you're pastoring a white church that's you know wealthy with assets, but not with people, basically sell it all or, or give it over to a growing non-white church and all the members just join that church. And there you've got a multicultural church. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> because then the power is given over, you know, the, the minoritized folks aren't kind of crawling in all like, thank you so much. We're, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's, it's actually moving into some sort of mutuality or, or a, a power shift. And it was just like, it, it, the idea far <laughs> yeah, like, I don't know. really interesting they, they, they pulled the rich young ruler on you they're like all right yeah. you're asking a little too much <laughs> that's really interesting i'd like to table that in terms of uh maybe the conversation that we have following the conversation is the idea of how how racist is it for churches with a lot of resources but very little people to continue to hold on Yes, especially in how systemic racism has worked to make those people wealthy in those churches. Bingo. Wealthy. Right. Bingo. Yeah, yep. that, that's, 
that's a, that's a piece of the consciousness for people of of earnestness or faith or spirituality that needs to be really like cemented in our brains and, and, and something done about it. And the flagships for that dynamic are really in mainline Protestantism mm -hmm. right? in, in, in the United States. Yeah. At least. I, I served a church once that had like multi-million dollar endowments and like nobody was showing up, but it was a bash. Whiteness <laughs> to a huge degree. Even with an organ, Rajiv, even with an organ. <laughs> Let, let's, let's save that. Cause that, well, that's the way of conversation. That he said, I won't be listening uh, because <laughs> I was saying that we fixed all of it. <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh hey Kelly Kelly joined the conversation mm -hmm. oh yeah well, it's, Kelly. it's in the soil yeah it's good I think we got some we got some good stuff unless there's any other thoughts on uh, this particular episode or anyone wants to chime in from the comments we'd love to hear from you um, but I mean at this point, what more can you say about think, white supremacy and evangelicalism? I think the question, oh, there, there's a lot more, well, Jeff. You, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you're talking about it. <laughs> Go ahead. We're done, right? Yeah. We're done for, 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 for <laughs> <laughs> figured it out. <laughs> uh, I, I think it'd be good to have a question. We have a question of the week. Post it in the comments for people to answer. And maybe the question will be, um, yeah. you know, did you ever hear about race or racism? in any of your church contexts? Maybe that's a good question to that's ask. A question. Mm -hmm. So if you're listening and you'd like to chime in on that, come to our page, find the comments, and answer that question that Alan posts, or you can just email it to us, and uh, we will share it amongst ourselves and uh, hear from you. Because um, again, the point of these continuing the conversations is that we really we really do want to hear from you. We want to we wanna extend the conversation mm -hmm. beyond the five of us or the three of us in this particular case. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, come up with stuff that's that's super relevant um uh, robin here we go this is the question robin asks how do you think racism can be fixed or do you think you do, can, or do you think i can't read apparently <laughs> that's less of a big question <laughs> well that, that's the follow-up jeff is why also, or why not also if you're a, if you're a youtube listener i just want to say we love you and see you you're my people <laughs> al, al has got this youtube <laughs> fantasy i yeah. love i love it He's going to start his own blogging channel soon, so look out for that. Wait, what? I didn't say that. <laughs> Robin, my, my answer to your question is yes. Mm. Love it. I say yes, but I don't think I'll see it, unfortunately. I hope I'm mm -hmm. I mean, so much of this stuff just boils down to the will. Yeah. You know, as, as uh, Bell Hooks puts it, you know, the title of her book is The Will to Change. One of her many books, uh, one of her best. But I mean, that's what it comes down to. This is a good, this is a good time for doing it right now. In the Any time is a good time for doing Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yeah. So you said yes. Yes. Yeah. I, I said yes, Robin. And I also said, said yes, yes but, but not in his lifetime. Actually, that's a really good point. Oh my goodness. Oh man. Like, I think people who lean on the intractability of it and just say it's a sin issue and say this is a hard issue and we will always be sinful and we'll always be dealing with it are people who are sidestepping the real ways that we can make progress. Thank you, Robin, for asking that. And thank you, Rajiv, for your answer. That's sure. something to think about. And Sarah, too, she says it'll. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. Uh, thank you, mm -hmm. sir. And then Richard asks, will it take mm -hmm. a generation or two? Possibly. I mean, what's there's a Jewish saying, it says you're not mm. uh you're not called to to finish the work, but neither are you allowed to to like not do it anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's you're not, it's you're not responsible for fixing all of it. It's it's I mean, it's not. much more poetic in, in <laughs> the actual thing. I'm I'm butchering it. Uh, Robin, this is a genuine, heartfelt question, and I know that a lot of people feel this way, but she says, I'm white, and I don't want to hurt anyone. I feel like there's nothing I can do. Yeah, uh, just real quick, at least for me, there, I, my cousin, Mona, on the show, uh, who used to be on the show, and 
Her name's uh, Melody. She's putting on a class if you'd like to learn more about ways that you can be involved. Um, and then there's other episodes that, that we've recorded, I think, that are really helpful that point to ways that you can help. But, like, you know, learning about that, those, those feelings of helplessness and how that's just a starting point, that's a great way to go. Because that, that, that is the, that's a good to know you're there. And that's definitely a place that other people have found themselves and moved past. And right. so there's, there is hope in that. But I appreciate you sharing that. Now we have a resource uh, list, an anti-racist resource list on Irenacast that uh, I found to be really helpful too. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, Jeff, Jeff, I mean, I can't remember which it was a while ago. You introduced a new phrase to me when it comes to the discomfort of these, this kind of work. You were like, sometimes you just got to show your ass. I was like, oh, yeah, <laughs> I don't think that's appropriate, Jeff. I, I think that's, that's a whole different subject. But, you know, where it's like sometimes you, you're you willing to stumble and fall yeah. and expose yourself to embarrassment, to be misunderstood, et cetera. And that's part of it. Um, and I think that's really insightful. So you're kind of um, responding to Robin a little bit on that comment. It's, you know the chances of you not making a mistake are, are pretty much zero. That's right. But in order to try, um, you know, and saying, I'm sorry, I want to learn are easy ways to, to take next steps. Um, so, you know, hopefully, hopefully you've got some people that you can jump into it with and, and get a little messy, but it, it, you know, any real relationship is messy. I mean, my God. Right. You know, if any of you have been in a spousal married relationship for any length of time. To the, ex- yeah. to the extent that you can be wrong and not make other people feel bad that you're wrong. Like that's, that's where all the magic is. Keep putting yourself out there. Keep being wrong. Keep growing and stretching. And when you are wrong and you feel that shame or that like woundedness, don't make it someone else's issue. Or right. feel something like right. Just right. Know that come and move straight through them. Yeah. Right. I know for me, there's that pressure of, and I think that this is part of the culture of whiteness, is that that pressure of, well, it's not going to make a difference. But I don't think that we need, like, we're not always going to make a difference. Like, some of what we're going to do is to be able to support and just listen and have that change of mindset. And sometimes that's enough. Like, there'll be times for us to make a difference, but sometimes that drive to make a difference, we end up kind of getting in that mode that we talked about earlier in this conversation where we become the white now we understand and we're going to do this. So I think that posture of just listening and being humble and being willing to be corrected is a very, very important one um, because people in power don't allow themselves to be corrected. And I think that's a protest to our own whiteness in, in a way. Um, uh, and then Kelly Anderson said, uh, Holiday said, uh, in the, the mm-hmm. 1619 project is a great starting point to understand the historic uh, systemic uh, links. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then Shannon shares as white people we can listen, spread the story, inequalities. And I, I'm a big proponent of uh, immigration justice and detention, visitation, and asylum seeking accompaniment. And I know that this is a really complex issue, but one of the ways that white supremacy is functioning right now is people who are undocumented are treated um, in horribly in inhumane ways in california as well as uh everywhere else in our country so t- take a look at um i think they I forgot to think they rebranded away from civic so maybe um freedom for immigrants but there are visitation programs you want to get get involved in that that's a good way to use your privilege to defend the rights of people who need to be protected right mm-hmm. right or just use your money like where you buy, like if you're going to buy a book on anti-racism, there are all kinds of links. And we do have one in that anti-racist resource list that we, that yeah. we have, I read a cast.com slash anti-racist where you can, all the the books in there are linked to black owned. Um, uh, 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 it's a list that's curated from our personal experience. So it does, it's not like fully, you know, comprehensive, but we do have a link to a comprehensive list. I know that's a little meta, but we have some resources there and uh, we encourage you to check those out. Um, yeah. And just a little piece on that. Don't be overwhelmed by the list. Right. Right. Just pick a thing. Right. Just, just pick a thing and, and dive in and then you can begin to make connections from there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, we, we didn't solve racism and we, 
this show won't, but uh, <laughs> thankful for the opportunity to, to be heard and to allow some of you to be heard and speak about these issues. And uh, we will continue this conversation in a way uh, with our episode next week, which will be uh, progress, uh, white supremacy and progressive Christianity. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Make sure that you're subscribed to the show platform that you are preferred to listen to. If you have any questions about any of that, you can always reach out to us at podcast at irenicast.com. And if you believe in the work that we're doing here and you'd like to partner with that, you can always donate to the, the show and our greater work that we're doing at, by going to irenicast.com slash PayPal. And if you can't remember all those irenicast.com slash whatever is that I'm saying all the time, just go to irenicast.com and <laughs> <laughs> it's all there. You can just scroll through it. And if you ever have any questions, we are very accessible with those. So, uh, this week, for this continuing the conversation, I'm Jeff. It's your boy, Alan. It's Rajiv. Thanks. I just repeated myself. Thanks for continuing the conversation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for joining. Bye. Peace. Peace.